The Brainwaves podcast is supported in part by Audible, the world's largest collection of ad-free audiobooks. Now that Game of Thrones is back on HBO, you might want to listen to the original novels by George R. R. Martin, some of which are narrated by the author himself. Just go to audibletrial.com slash brainwaves, and you can listen to your first book for free. Then, it's less than 15 bucks a month to keep the subscription going. So check it out at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. Jim Siegler here. This week's show is a rerun of an episode we did a little over a year ago on the relationship between Stroke and Peyton Freeman Ovale, or PFO. We've remastered the audio since then, because it was pretty horrible in 2016, and we added a brief update for you at the end in light of the recently published data, which is going to change the way that we treat patients who have PFO. Take a listen. There was an interesting case report I read of a very unusual, atypical kind of cryptogenic stroke patient with multiple possible etiologies. The patient was a middle-aged woman with both an underlying malignancy as well as a compressed renal vein with compression of the inferior vena cava, uh, as well as a PFO. And she ended up receiving anticoagulation systemically for having a, an associated DVT as well as an IBC filter and a closure device with the amplasma. And I thought that might have been a little bit overkill, but the argument, and perhaps rightfully so, was that the IVC filter itself may only prevent clots greater than 3 to 5 millimeters in diameter, and the middle cerebral artery diameter is less than 5 millimeters, so perhaps small clots could get through the IVC filter, especially after the filter is removed, they could pass freely, and then cross over into the systemic circulation to that PFO. Welcome back to Brainwaves. I'm Jim Siegler, and today I will be talking with Dr. Christopher Favilla, one of the vascular neurology fellows at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. So thanks so much for joining us on the show today, Chris. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Chris, can you kind of just talk me through how we thought that PFO is related to stroke? Sure. So, I mean, mechanistically speaking, uh, the general thought is that PFO provides a potential for a right-to-left shunt. The majority of physiologic conditions with high left-sided cardiac pressures, that potential space is forced closed, but during you know, sensations like coughing or Vesalva maneuvers or a number of pathologic conditions, elevated right-sided pressures allow for transient shunt from right to left and allow for what's thought to be referred to as paradoxical embolism, or a scenario in which clot from the venous system can bypass the pulmonary circulation, go right to the left heart, and embolize out systemically throughout the body. It's also plausible that the uh, potential space uh, generated by this PFO between the septum primum and secundum provides the potential for some uh, increased thrombogenicity along the septal wall. Uh, That at least sort of sets the stage mechanistically as to why we think that a PFO might cause a stroke. Uh, Are there any data to support that Valsalva or increased right heart strain actually are causally related to the development of stroke? Have, Have there been reports that um, Valsalva before stroke in patients with a PFO may be related? Interestingly, the, that's probably the best argument that helps explain why the vast majority of patients we ever see, and we presume that the PFO is, is pathogenic of the stroke that we're seeing them for, um, is that there are some, you know, in the era of high resolution echocardiography, we're able to see that there is some normal right-to-left shunting in patients who have PFO during normal components of the cardiac cycle, so independent of a salva, independent of coughing. Not only that, but the fact that the um, some of the edge of the PFO itself may be a bit more thrombogenic, the atria itself may be a bit more thrombogenic along those um, edges may also help to explain why. Maybe you don't even need a paradoxical embolization. You can just have embolization from a thrombus formed along the atrial wall itself. The real relationship between PFO and cryptogenic stroke is mostly pulled, as you pointed out, from retrospective studies. Um, The the pretty low event rate of stroke in the PFO community um, really makes this an entity that's best studied in the case control environment. And unfortunately, because it, it, or perhaps fortunately, because it doesn't happen so often, that is stroke, makes it very hard to study it in a more robust model, like a cohort or prospective study. Um, So this is largely case control data, and there have been mixed results from prior case control studies. The most 
powerful finding, the most robust finding, seems to be amongst cryptogenic stroke patients that are particularly young, where there seems to be, as you pointed out, that really potent relationship between presence of PFO and cryptogenic stroke. As patients get older and older, it seems like that relationship washes out a little bit. That's largely thought to be because of the accumulation of other vascular risk factors as we age that may be more implicative in the context of that stroke. Um, Really, to get to the the base of this, I think practically speaking, when you have a patient in front of you who has a cryptogenic stroke and who has a PFO, the question you want to be able to answer for your patient and really for yourself is whether or not that PFO is in fact pathogenic. One tool that's particularly useful is um, something that came out of the, the ROPE study and they've generated a subsequent ROPE score. ROPE meaning risk of paradoxical embolism. And really what they've done is they've merged a number of studies. These are 12 cohorts for a total of over 2,500 patients that have been uh, pulled to generate this risk stratification score. And at the end, the score basically generates a probabilistic um, outlook as to whether or not that stroke that you're looking in front of you came from the PFO or not. And as you might imagine, the score is sort of a list of other vascular risk factors, age, other things that accumulate. And really, at the end of the day, what it's telling you is that young, healthy patients without other vascular risk factors who've suffered a cryptogenic stroke and have PFO, it's more likely to be pathogenic in that patient. In contrast to an older individual with a number of other vascular risk factors, it may be less likely to be pathogenic in that circumstance. But the ROPE score is a very effective tool to sort of put a number on that for you and for your patient. Say you do the uh, lower extremity Dopplers and there doesn't seem to be any deep vein thrombosis. Um, how do you medically manage these patients? Sure. So there's a, uh, I think, two schools of thought. One is medical management and then one is procedural surgical management. And I'm sure we'll talk about that next. But from a medical perspective, the, the question is a simple one. It's really whether or not you want to place the patient on antiplatelet agents or whether or not you want to anticoagulate them. First and foremost, we can pull from the WARS trial, which is, of course, a prospective randomized trial looking at the comparison of aspirin versus warfarin for secondary stroke prevention, and that's all comers. Um, So you'd have to take a subgroup of WARS to pull the 265 patients that had cryptogenic strokes. Or not only that, but we want to answer the question for cryptogenic stroke patients, those of whom had a PFO. So if you look at that sub-subgroup analysis, there does not seem to be a difference in the stroke occurrence rates between aspirin and warfarin going forward. So again, that would argue not a big difference between anticoagulating them or using antiplatelet. Um, But again, the numbers are small, the data are very imprecise with huge confidence intervals, and point estimates might suggest that warfarin um, is a bit superior in that circumstance, just didn't reach clinical significance, statistical significance, excuse me. Thereafter, the PFO and cryptogenic stroke study, or PICS, Uh, Another prospective randomized trial of aspirin versus warfarin in cryptogenic stroke. And in that circumstance, again, there was no difference in the treatment, whether it be aspirin or warfarin for those patient groups. Interestingly enough, in the PICS study, you know, we always talk about how PFO increases their risk of stroke. If you look at those with and without PFO, there actually was no increased secondary stroke risk in the PFO group itself. So it almost makes you feel like if there's any benefit to warfarin, it might be in any stroke regardless, not necessarily in the context of PFO. And that study was not limited like the subgroup analysis of the subgroup analysis of wars where there were only 98 patients, there were almost 1,000 patients in the big study, so it's a little bit more power to perform that analysis. That's absolutely right. It certainly was. Why do we think that the closure is going to be superior to anticoagulation? If it's a patient who's at risk of venous uh, venous clot and subsequent embolization, uh, closure might prevent paradoxical embolization, but would still leave that very same patient at risk of PEs and um, you know venous system, venous emboli to the pulmonary system, which is obviously of significant importance, even if that doesn't bring the patient to the care of a stroke doctor. Um, the the real idea is that this might spare those individuals though of needing to be on anticoagulation from perspective of stroke prevention. Okay, and now let's move on to the surgical management. So what kind of surgical options do you consider in patients with PFO and a cryptogenic stroke? I think first and foremost, we can at least comment on open surgical management, maybe open cardiac surgery for, for closure. And that's rarely done and largely only done in populations where open cardiac surgery is indicated for an alternative reason at that point in time. By and large, when we're thinking about this on the stroke ward, we're thinking about percutaneous closure. Um, percutaneous closure has obviously been a hot topic over the past several years and has been the topic of three prospective randomized trial for the purposes of secondary stroke prevention. Closure 1, which was a a sizable randomized trial looking at almost a 1,000 patients with cryptogenic stroke and PFO, Um, and worth pointing out that patients in Closure 1 were first closed with the um, NMT Medical StarFlex device, 
These almost 1,000 patients were randomized one-to-one to either medical therapy or closure. Medical arm was basically treated with either antiplatelet or anticoagulation at the discretion of the treating physician. Um, and ultimately, there were no significant differences in secondary stroke rates between these groups. It's worth pointing out that the event rate itself was exceptionally low. What we did find was that the device itself carries some significant risks. There's a few percent risk of uh, about 3% risk in this particular study of significant device-related complications, which include things like cardiac uh, perforation and significant hemorrhage. Um, And also the device itself seems to uh, increase the risk of subsequent development of new atrial fibrillation, um, much higher in the closure arm as compared to the medical therapy arm. Uh, Thereafter, a very similar trial, the PC trial, looked at a St. Jude device. It's called the Amplatsar device. Um, Again, randomized very similarly to medical therapy at the discretion of the the investigator versus closure with this alternative device. And again, no significant difference between treatments. Um, And again, seems to be a few percent complication rate and also seems to be a slightly increased risk of atrial fibrillation in the closure arm itself. Um, Very similar trial, the RESPECT trial, but about twice the size, 980 patients. Again, randomized to medical therapy at the discretion of the investigator and closure with the St. Jude device, very similar to the PC trial device. Um, and once again, found that there was no significant increase in, uh, in stroke rates in the medical therapy arm as compared to the closure arm, um, even though it does seem like the point estimates seem to favor closure. One thing that I found very interesting about the RESPECT trial was that the analysis of their primary outcome was not significant, but in the per-protocol analysis, they did find that there was a statistically significant benefit over time to closure. Yeah, the post-hoc analysis has some validity. I think in this particular situation, the, the value is that the, the dropout rate and crossover rate is so wildly high in these studies. I mean, we look at the event rate, which is incredibly small in the order of a couple of percent, whereas the crossover rate in respect in particular, there was you know 9% of the closure arm dropped out of a study and twice that of the medical therapy arm dropped out. So you have such a huge number of patients that are either dropping out or crossing over. The post hoc analysis for that reason does have some validity. I mean, it certainly maybe at least sheds light on the fact that there may actually be a benefit there, right? There was statistical significance at that point in time. It's hard to take post hoc analysis and say that it, it puts a stamp of sort of definitive benefit of therapy there, but it certainly opens your eyes to the possibility and at least makes us think about this a bit more seriously in subsequent studies. With that being said, we would interpret the Amplatzer device as being potentially more favorable in terms of recurrent stroke reduction compared to the NMT medical Starflex device. In follow-up pooled analyses of the trials that used the Amplatzer device, did we find any data to support that surgical or percutaneous closure is better than medical management? So a pooled analysis of the two trials together, again, as you pointed out, because that puts almost 1,500 patients together in one place who use the same device of closure and very similar protocols, there seems to, again, be the same suggestion of benefit to closure. Um, You know, still, event rates are incredibly low. Magnitude of effect is small. The data are imprecise with wide confidence intervals. Um, We're talking about a a stroke recurrent risk of of 2.2%. Um, this is really quite small. And again, crossover rate and dropout rates are incredibly high, right? We're talking about cross out, crossover dropout rates about eight times the height of the actual endpoint we're trying to measure, which is stroke. makes it very difficult to sort of have any strength in the evidence itself. I think really at the end of the day, what this means for our, our management is to say that the, the strength of the evidence is not there that can allow us to confidently make a recommendation for closure for these patients. Uh, what it does is sort of open our eyes to the possibility and perhaps um, emphasizes the need for additional studies in the future, particularly with attention to the, the issue with dropout and crossover and trying to address that in future studies to uh, allow for slightly more powerful evidence. I think there's hope that maybe you know one of these closure devices will make it clear that it's superior to medical therapy. At this point in time, I think the truth of the matter is that the associated 3.5% significant um, adverse events perioperatively from the implants or device makes it very difficult. Um, Between the debatable efficacy conjunction with the significant procedural risk, it just makes it very challenging to to endorse percutaneous PFL closure in patients with cryptogenic stroke at this point. I think future studies might convince us otherwise. Uh, We will see as we can continue to place these devices in more and more safe manners. But right now, it's just very hard to look at this data and confidently endorse the use of the device in our typical patients with genetic stroke and PFL.
So Chris, it's been a little over a year since we last spoke. What do we know about PFL closure for stroke now? Sure, Jim. Thanks for having me back. After we spoke in August of 2016, and the long-term follow-up data from the RESPECT trial was presented, and what that interestingly showed was that with a, an average follow-up of just under six years for their patient population, they now were able to achieve statistical significance in their intention to treat analysis, whereas in their, uh, as we previously discussed in their first publication, they were not able to reach significance in the intention to treat population, only in the per-protocol population, which was sort of fraught with some limitations based on the dropout rate and the very low stroke rate. But now we're able to learn that there's a statistically significant difference in the rate of secondary stroke in the long-term follow-up data. Importantly, we do learn something else from this long-term follow-up data, and that it's, uh, there was actually a higher rate of DVT and PE in the closure group as compared to the medical therapy group. Um, and this is perhaps related to the fact that there was a higher rate of anticoagulation used in the medical therapy arm. As you remember, as we discussed last time on this topic, the medical therapy arm was sort of treated at the discretion of the enrolling investigator with either antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation. Some of the newer data to support the use of PFO closure devices for stroke prevention comes from a trial we haven't discussed yet, which is the REDUCE trial. Can you kind of summarize those results for us? Sure. This is a trial that was uh, sponsored by Gore and studied a slightly different device, whereas previously we were talking about the Amplatzer septal occluder, now the Amplatzer PFO occluder. In the REDUCE trial, what we looked at was uh, the use of a, a Gore helix septal occluder and a, a Gore cardio, cardioform septal occluder versus medical therapy. Again, same general structure. You're comparing medical therapy to closure, and the medical therapy arm in this scenario was either aspirin, Plavix, or aspirin plus extended release diprimidol. These data were presented at the 2017 European Stroke Organization Conference, along with another trial that we'll get to in a second. What we find here is that there was, again, a statistically significant reduction in the long-term stroke rate in those patients that underwent closure. How clinically significant would you say these results are? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you always hear statistical significance when these sorts of results are presented, but it's worth pointing out that in the or reduced trial, the recurrent stroke rate was relatively small in both arms. And this is true sort of across the board in these sorts of trials. That's an important thing to keep in mind. You're looking at a, a stroke rate in the medical therapy arm at about 1.7 per 100 person years, and in the closure arm of 0.39 per 100 person years. So these are sort of relatively small rates, which is not shocking, right? The, the risk of these PFOs causing stroke in the first place is relatively low, which is why some of these trials either have low point estimates or it takes a long time, a number of years of follow-up before they can actually identify a difference between the groups. And in addition to REDUCE, there is also this new trial, the CLOSE trial. How is that different from REDUCE and RESPECT? Sure. So at the, the same conference in the spring of 2017 at which the REDUCE trial was presented, the French study called the CLOSE trial was also presented. Similar structure to RESPECT and REDUCE, but CLOSE had unique inclusion criteria prior to randomization. Slightly different patient selection in this scenario. It wasn't just a cryptogenic stroke with a, with a PFO. It was a PFO plus another risk factor, and that risk factor was either the presence of an atrial septal aneurysm or the presence of a large shunt. Further, the medical arm was treated slightly differently than the medical arms of RESPECT and REDUCE. In this scenario, medical therapy was either aspirin or anticoagulation. Nevertheless, the results were still impressive, and they favored transcatheter closure using any approved closure device in France. Again, after a little over five years of follow-up, we find a statistically significant reduction in the secondary stroke rate in the closure group. Uh, impressively enough, there were 14 strokes in the medical management arm and zero strokes in the closure arm. But this doesn't mean that all questions are answered. Some patients are unable to undergo PFO closure for various reasons, and we don't really know the optimal antithrombotic management for those people. If you look back to some of the older data comparing antiplatelet therapy to anticoagulation, it's never been clear that there's superiority of one over the other, which is why most of us would simply use antiplatelet therapy in the absence of another obvious reason to anticoagulate these patients, meaning a DVT, a PE, an underlying hyper, uh, thrombophilia or hypercoagulable source. The French CLOSE trial did sort of attempt to get at this by randomizing not just to medical management versus closure, but within that medical management arm, patients were randomized to either aspirin or anticoagulation. You know, we were hopeful that this would really help shed some light on this issue as well. However, there is a bit of a catch there because when patients were enrolled in this trial, 
they weren't necessarily all eligible for both aspirin or anticoagulation. So if you were in the medical management arm, but you know you you had a specific reason why your provider wanted you to be anticoagulated or wanted you to be on an aspirin, they could preferentially indicate that when they're randomizing you. Specifically, they could randomize you to either anticoagulation or closure, not to one of all three. Um, in fact, a minority of the patients in the trial were eligible for all three therapies, which again limits any interpretation from the, the antiplatelet versus anticoagulation arms. So still unclear. Still unclear. I mean, for what it's worth, there was, you know, the antiplatelet versus anticoagulation was head to head compared, and there was no statistically significant difference. The hazard ratio seems to favor anticoagulation, um, but again, sort of limited based on the way these patients were actually enrolled and who was eligible for each arm of the study. After the fall of 2016, when the long-term data from REDUCE was first presented, the FDA approved the St. Jude and Platzer device for PFO closure in the States with patients with cryptogenic stroke. So now at least it's a little bit more feasible to close these patients from a practical question of do you want to. Um, I, I think it's still a very patient-specific question. And the important thing to remember is that all of these trials focused on young patients with cryptogenic stroke, which means a couple things. One, they all specifically capped at about 60 years of age, so these should be focused on our younger patients, not our traditional stroke population. And cryptogenic stroke means that the underlying mechanism needs to be thoroughly evaluated. You can't sort of, you know, at the time of admission, identify a PFL in their echo and immediately start thinking about closure. You have to make sure you go down a very thorough road of workup to rule out any other underlying etiology that might be managed in a different way. And if you do find another etiology or another potential etiology, your efforts should really focus on treatment of that potential etiology rather than the PFO. Again, we can't lose sight of the fact that PFO is present in about one in four of us in the general population. We're going to find a lot of incidental PFOs, and it's not necessarily appropriate to be closing all of those incidentally identified PFOs when there's another stroke mechanism. Again, Dr. Christopher Favilla. For more information about what he and I discussed today and to access the important press releases and to get links to great supplementary content about PFO closure, now that these clinical trials have been published or they're in press, check out our blog at brainwaves.me. Also, if you have a second, please rate our show on iTunes, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and spread the word if you've been enjoying our podcast. As always, this podcast is intended for medical education only. I'm 100% sure that there are going to be cardiac surgeons out there who want to start closing everybody's PFO. That is not what we're trying to recommend here. We are making no recommendations for management anyway, just trying to provide educational materials. Today's episode was produced by myself with the help of Christopher Favilla. Music this week was courtesy of Marcos H. Bolanos and Lee Rosevere. I'm Jim Sigler for Brainwaves. Thanks for listening.